again, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today, and we just rejoice, and we want to be glad in all the blessings of the Lord, all that he's provided for us. Dr. Nix looks like he's full of sleep today. We congratulate him and Michaela on the new edition. Amen. Yeah. We're thankful all has went well there, and we continue to pray for them. We're thankful for our guests from First Baptist Church of Barberville today who are here to support our guest uh, speaker, our chapel speaker today. Give them a hand. Thank them for being here. <laughs> We're going to save our speaker introduction for a little bit later on in the service. Uh, but at this time, we're going to pray, and then our singers are going to come, and we're going to worship Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day, the privilege you've given us to assemble together here. Father, we praise you for your son and for the gift of salvation that you've made available through his death and his resurrection. We pray, Father, that you would move in this time together to encourage our hearts, Father, to just strengthen us in the faith, uh, to make us, mold us, shape us, Father, into the vessels of honor that you desire for us to be. Lift burdens today. I pray that you heal hurts. Father, I pray you comfort the grieving, Lord, just give strength to the weak, Father. Lord, most importantly, we pray you convict the lost, Lord, all around the world. Bring them to faith in Christ as their Savior, that they would believe before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Clear Creek, thank you guys so much for your prayers. Yes, Emery Lynn Nix was born last Thursday at 1.08 a.m., so I haven't slept since then. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, all praise to the Father for my beautiful daughters. I've got Brinley at home, and now Emery, and my wife Michaela is doing well, but thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, praying for us, and uh, we just love you guys so much. So, with that said, let's stand together and worship our Savior. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is
As we get ready to enter into our time of prayer, um, the next song we're going to sing after our time of prayer is a song that we're going to do for our night of worship. So for you that may be in town in the area, we'd love for you to join us this Thursday night at 7 p.m. But now, join me sitting, standing, or at this altar. Let's go to the throne in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning that we can declare that you are our solid rock on which we stand, that all other ground truly is sinking sand. Lord, how flippantly we sing through some of the familiar songs, God, without truly understanding the meaning. That's why the book of Psalms has all of those selahs, which mean pause, to reflect. And God, I pray this morning that we are reflecting on you and you alone, that all distractions will fade away. That what we've got to do at work or in our studies or what's to come, Lord, in this moment will just pale in comparison to us worshiping you around the throne in this moment with all of the saints and angels that went before us, God, in one accord declaring how holy you are. And no matter, no matter what we're going through, you are going to hold us fast because you are our anchor. So, God, now as we continue this time of worship, we ask for you to help us turn our eyes towards you and let all distraction fade away. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.
And most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for holding us fast. And Lord, now as we enter into worship through your word, let us hold fast to your word. Be with our student, Alistair, Lord, as now he's stepping into his senior chapel. And God, may he give you all the glory for how steadfastly you've held him and these other students in their studies and their preparation. And may we all give you the glory and honor for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Nix. Thank you, Clear Creek Singers. Good morning, Clear Creek. Good morning. So good to be in chapel together today. And I was just sitting back there thinking of all the different times in my ministry in all the different places where I have introduced speakers. Frankly, I've forgotten a lot of them, but I do believe this one will be the most memorable. Let me say a word to the school before I say much more about our speaker this morning. Uh, it is no absolute misunderstanding that Clear Creek holds a dear and a very special place in the hearts and lives of the Dodson family. Like the Diddies and some others were a family whom... Clear Creek has blessed now multi-generational. Uh, Clear Creek is my father's alma mater. It's mine. And as the Lord leads and blesses, in a few weeks it'll be Alistair's. Now let me give you some good, better, and best news. The good news is Clear Creek survived Dodson number one. <laughs> The better news is Clear Creek survived Dodson number two. And I'm just going to claim it by the grace of God. <laughs> In a few days from now, Clear Creek will have survived Dodson number three. And without a doubt, that is the best news. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, what, what a beautiful thing in the wisdom and the sovereignty of God that Alistair has been here not only for these four years of studies but particularly this last year. It has been uh, the worst year of our family's life and I remember on March 31st when I received uh, that dreadful call last year uh, one of the first calls I made was to my dear friend, your president, Brother Charlie Goodman. And I said, Charlie, I don't know what you're doing, but you, you need to find Alistair. And he dropped everything and went to his side and then took him immediately to our faithful friends at First Baptist Barber Bowl who took over from there and brought him on to the hospital. And, of course, you know the chain of events over those next few days. But just a little over a year ago, uh, I saw a son that had grown in a remarkable way and has everything to do with the guidance that he has received here at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. I saw him stand up in front of about 1,600 people at his brother's funeral and just proclaim an amazing word from God. You can't do that without a certain level of Christian maturity. And uh, I want to say this. Alistair, I know that you wish a few other people were here with us. But here's what I believe. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, describes this great cloud of witnesses. And I understand the context. It described all those faithful heroes from the Old Testament who had demonstrated lives of faith, and certainly they're a part of the composition of that cloud of witnesses. But I believe there are three or four others that are part of that today. And I want you to know, son, they're proud of you. Thank you for being who you are. Here's what I can say about your speaker this morning. He's true to himself. <laughs> he, 
And we would have him no other way, right? But more than that, he loves the Lord. And he loves you fiercely. And son, when you come and preach, don't pay any attention to these guys over here. They're your biggest fans. And we're here today, Brother Alistair, because we love you and we're anxious to hear God's word through you. You come and preach. <laughs> Y'all ever heard the expression, seeing your whole laugh? You go, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have have y'all ever heard the expression, seeing your whole life flash before your eyes? I mean, I'm just sitting here on that front bench with Dr. Smith, and I'm just thinking back to, uh, hi Zion, I love you. I think of a young man uh, who wrote the word popcorn on the side of Cornerstone Baptist Church in Somerset, I'm not Somerset, in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh and the lack of his father that soon followed. Uh, I think of a young man who was plunged beneath blessed waters by his father and his grandfather. I think of a young man who fished with his grandpa and just grabbed a fish, I don't even know what kind it was, out of a creek and just held it open like, great dad, look what I got. Uh, <laughs> before I get started, I want to say a word of thanks to my professors. Uh, Y'all have been such an encouragement to me and my family over the last several months, and uh, I love you. To my fellow colleagues who were, who I saw standing in a perfect line on one of the darkest days I have ever seen in my life. I love y'all. Uh, to uh, I want to say a special thanks to my pastors, uh, Pastor Brother Ed, who wasn't able to be here today, my own dad, and uh, Pastor Tyler, who have completely uh, poured into me. I want to thank a special word of thanks to the men who have discipled me, Shane, uh, Tyler, uh, Tom, Dad, Granddad, Pops. Uh, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Smith, Dr. Diddy, and then all of you other professors. Uh, ooh. <laughs> uh, and then I, like Dad said, I want to thank, take some time out to thank three special individuals who couldn't be here today. I want to thank my granddad, who, uh, who really, uh, Sorry, <laughs> that was nasty. Uh, <laughs> who really pointed me in the right direction and who taught me to be a man of prayer. And I want to thank my pops who uh, taught me how to act like one during immense suffering. And I want to thank uh, the Lord for allowing me to pour into a young man that, had no, that I really had no choice. Uh, rather it be brawling on Christmas Eve and breaking dad's nose or uh, just going to Chick-fil-A and trying something new. I'd like to ask y'all today if you would stand with me and out of the reverence, out of the God we serve and open to 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 through 8. Once you all find your spaces, your spots, I will read from the word of God. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself, thank you, 
but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, and there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And and the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Join me in prayer. More, Lord, my heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the blessings of these people that are in this room, family, friends, teachers. And Lord, I pray that you would allow me to bless them in a moment as they have blessed me. And Lord, I just ask that you would strengthen my tongue, strengthen my body, strengthen my mind, and pour over me that I might speak honorably and holy to you. And Lord, I thank you for how far you've brought me and how far you will take me. And Lord, I'm thankful for Clear Creek and what she means to me. And Lord, I pray for all those that will come after me. And Lord, I thank you, I praise you, I honor you. In the name of Jesus, amen. I believe if you are in God's service, regardless of what you do, 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 8, has something to say to you. We all have demands, whether it be school, personal life, and sometimes just ministry. Because let's be honest, sheep have a mind of their own. (laughs) We all get drained from time to time. And so did Elijah. Elijah. Elijah had just won his metaphorical Super Bowl on Mount Carmel, but we don't see him going to Disney World, we don't see him in a commercial, we don't see him just hooting and a hollering, no. We see or, riding him, or him riding off in the sunset in great triumph. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we find an old, wore-out prophet under a broom tree. Even though Israel saw the prophet's of Baal destroyed, they still did not repent. They did not relent in their idolatry. Ahab did not obey God's word. And Jezebel did not change her wicked ways. Because of it all, Elijah was drained. Paul House calls him a prophet drained of strength in a pit of fear and desperation. In this passage, Elijah's condition serves as a warning to each of us. James 5.17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. This means that just like the great prophet, we can become exhausted. As God's servants, when we are drained, we must retreat from our demands, rest and rely on God's provision to be restored. This is a prophet and a broom tree. It leads me to my first point. Retreat from your demands and rest. You may have heard some people teach this text and put Elijah down. Some even go as far as to make fun of him for running. From Jezebel after defeating 450 prophets of Baal. Do you know who you don't find saying find saying that or anything remotely like that in the story you find God you find the Lord instead of giving punishment you find him giving grace you find him giving rest and restoration God lovingly prepared him for an assignment that was ahead notice in verses 1 and 3 that after Ahab had gone and reported to Jezebel of what had happened on Mount Carmel, she threatened to have Elijah killed. I don't know how, because he literally just killed 450 dudes and called fire from heaven. So good luck with that. (laughs) 
What was Elijah's response? Let's look again at verse 3. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. The courageous prophet who had just defeated 450 prophets now runs as far and as fast as he can. To help you understand this, I've been to Israel three times. That's not a, that's not a boast. I'm trying to be nice. Uh, the Jezreel Valley is in the northern part of Israel, and Beersheba is in the south. They're about 120 miles apart. That's why the verse clearly points out that Beersheba belonged to Judah. In other words, Elijah is getting out of Dodge. Then according to verse 4, he goes another day's journey from Beersheba out to the wilderness, the wilderness of Zin, the same wilderness that Moses led the Israelites on their way in, even though they didn't really come in. And there he sits down under a broom tree and prays, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah is so tired and depressed he prays for death. And if I can speak on the behalf of all these men of God and all those men of God that are out here, guys, you're going to come home and one night you're going to pray the exact same thing. There are many reasons Hebrew Bible scholars give, oops, sorry. There are many reasons Hebrew Bible scholars give for Elijah running from Jezebel and being so depressed. Here's a list of four. He lost his perspective on how evil Ahab and Jezebel really were. He lost his commitment to following God's word. He lost his vision of God's greatness. He lost his fight. Here's the one reason the Bible does make clear. Elijah was drained. He was worn out. And as people say, he was tired to the bone. Verse 5 says, And he lay down and slept under a broom tray, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He was so exhausted and slept so profoundly that an angel had to come and poke him and wake him up. Man, I wish I had a lick of sleep like that at Kelly Hall. <laughs> he was exhausted physically. Before the battle of Mar on Mount Carmel, he had been on the run for three solid years. After the victory, he ran about 17 miles, going top speed to Jezreel. When you add that he traveled one, another 120 miles to Beersheba, then to the wilderness, I imagine that he didn't just fall asleep. He probably collapsed like a sack of bricks. He was exhausted emotionally. We are told that after a victory, there's an emotional letdown. Just imagine that. You just prove once and for all, Yahweh is God. The water is licked up by fire. The stones are consumed. And that heifer is nothing but heifer dust. And they all confess with their mouths that Yahweh is God. But what does the Bible say? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far. We can only imagine how his adrenaline pumped and how it filled his heart and his spirit soared on Mount Carmel only to come crashing down like it was the day after Christmas. Most of all, he was exhausted spiritually. More than Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah was Satan's bullseye. This had to drain him. He needed to get away and rest. Which brings me to another person that was completely drained and needed rest. I believe, for a matter of fact, the greatest athlete of our age is not Michael Jordan. It's not LeBron James. 
It is a swimmer from Baltimore, Maryland named Michael Phelps. He has a total of 23 Olympic gold medals. There are only four people tied for second place with nine gold medals each. Do the math. Not even half of Michael's. 2004 Athens, he won six. 2008 Beijing, he won eight. And 2012 London, he dropped four. After London, he announced his retirement and said, I was so tired that I just wanted to be done with swimming. And I didn't want anything to do with the sport anymore. Do you know what he said? He retreated and arrested from the sport of swimming. I'm not saying that he did everything he should have done. But the point is, he knew he needed to pull away from the demands of swimming and rest his body. What were the results? After resting, he realized he wasn't finished. He mounted a massive comeback and won five more gold medals in the 2016 Rio Olympic Summer Games. Now he has 23, and Michael is now swimming in a league of his own, and his success may never be repeated. He pulled away and rested, then came back with an even stronger finish. While some people criticize and make fun of Elijah, I think Elijah did exactly what he needed to do. He got away. He retreated from his demands and rested. He did it. He needed it so badly that verse 6 says that he laid down again after the angel woke him up the first time and fed him. When your body, emotions, and spirit are exhausted, retreat from your demands and rest. And sometimes that's the only thing you can do. There's some things in, uh, I think of war, there's some things called a tactical retreat. Sometimes armies can have the upper hand and they still pull back to just reestablish the plan to let the warriors rest, to hang it up and just take a drink of water. One thing I did learn at Clear Creek, no surprise, I actually learned something. You can get your laughs out, go ahead. <laughs> Coming from my freshman year in Dr. Fox's spiritual formation class is that solitude is a discipline. Like prayer and Bible reading, pulling away and retreating. Wow, that clock is moving fast. <laughs> retreating is a discipline of our faith. Some people say they prefer to get burnt out than rust out, but that just might be how you die out. Don't be selfish. God wants your best. He doesn't want the leftovers. He wants that choice meat of your sacrifice. Give him that. He doesn't want beef jerky. He wants the steak. God doesn't want that for us. As someone once said, God doesn't want you to burn out or rust out. He wants you to last out. Jesus would retreat often and practice solitude. Listen to what the Gospel of Luke says about Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 16. But he would withdraw to a desolate places and pray. And you may not be able to take an extended vacation or travel far away like Elijah did, but you can always find a day to rest and or just a couple of hours for a walk. And we all desperately want to be like Jesus. God provided a Sabbath for his people Israel. One of my favorite sayings in Israel is spoken on Friday evening through the Saturday evening. Shabbat Shalom. It means have peace on your Sabbath. The Jewish people slow down and rest one day per week. And I tell you what, we wouldn't have as many grumpy deacons in church if they did that. <laughs> Listen, I had to make a deacon joke. We all do it. <laughs> Under the new covenant, we no longer follow the Sabbath law. But we still have a Sabbath principle. Do it. 
when you're exhausted, retreat from your demands and rest. And secondly, rely on God's provision and be restored. How did God minister to his worn out servant? He provided him and restored him. God did not rebuke Elijah at this point. Verse 5 says he sent an angel to tell him, arise and eat. He provided a broom tree and allowed him to rest and restored him physically with food. Elijah had to live off of God's provisions before he did it again. The Lord had fed him with a raven and a widow, and now he uses an angel to feed the prophet. A cake of bread. Verse 6 says, he, and he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. Then a second time, God provides for his servant. Verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Notice how God provided and restored for Elijah. And he had everything he needed. He had everything he needed to do what God wanted him to do. Verse 8, and he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Elijah was now strong enough to go for 40 days and 40 nights to the mount Horeb. Now that is some good bread. Isn't it encouraging to see that God supplies and restores his exhausted prophet instead of answering Elijah's prayer for death? What a blessing. In a stead, instead of death, God provides Elijah a broom tree for shade, sleep for his body, food for his hunger, and restoration for his future. What a gracious God he is. God will remind Elijah later that he's in charge, but he provides and restores at this moment. Elijah isn't the only servant of the Lord who needed a provision, a restoration. I think of Peter in the New Testament. You know his story. Apostle with a foot-shaped mouth, you know the whole thing. Uh, you know his story. After promising Jesus he would never turn his back, that he would follow him to death, to the end, he turned his back. Jesus warned Peter that he would hear the rooster crow, and he denied Jesus three times. Later, Jesus supplied precisely what Peter needed and restored him. After the resurrection, Peter and his friends retreated from Jerusalem and went to Galilee to fish, as fishermen do. One morning, after fishing all night and catching nothing, Jesus told them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. They did, and they couldn't haul in the fish and that, that the Lord had supplied. And look at Peter's response. He died. He swam like Michael Phelps. He went on a tear for the Lord. And God, the Lord, gave him exactly what he needed. The last time I was in Israel, it seemed like I could hear a rooster crow every time I turned my head. I honestly think that God gave that to me as a reminder. A reminder that it's not me that's perfect. It wasn't a Peter and Elijah, that is perfect. But just like them, I have to fall on God. I get tired, but he is always gracious to supply what I need to restore my, that I need to be restored. What do you need today? Rely on God and he will supply it in his way and in his time. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I am old. And yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his ch children begging for bread. Elijah needed shelter. God gave him a broom tree. Elijah needed rest. God gave him sleep. Elijah needed food and God gave him a cake. Elijah needed restoration. God prepared him for his next assignment and, and rely on God's provision and be restored. My provision, my prayer is that all of us will finish well, whatever God 
has given us to do. Are you drained and feel defeated like Elijah? Remember, you need physical rest. I know Dr. Smith does. He just had his third baby. Well, four, four, my bad. And Dr. Nix, you're probably not so hot either, are you? <laughs> Some people say, I'll rest when I'm dead. Well, God might just let you try that. Don't push yourself until you can't go anymore. That isn't healthy for you to do or for the people around you. Psalm 139.14 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God has wonderfully created our bodies to tell us when we need rest. I can feel it right now. Kelly Hall's calling my name. <laughs> when your body says you need some rest, get it. Take a nap on Sunday afternoon. Go on a walk. Find a few days to be away. You'll be more useful to God than a raisin. Remember to get your spiritual rest in Jesus. Hear his words. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest because I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find a rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 29. When you have had enough and look to him, you find he is enough. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah was finished with his ministry. He was even finished with life. But God was not finished with him. After he gets what he needs under the broom tree, God takes him to Mount Horeb and reminds Elijah just who is in charge. And that he was. And perfectly restores him to ministry. He goes back to the kingdom of Israel and fulfills everything God has him left to do. Then the day came when Elijah and his, two, his young understudy Elisha traveled to Bethel and they crossed the river Jordan. And, still, and as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Can you see that? It's beautiful. The obedience of God is rewarded with no death. Brothers and sisters, let us commit today to do everything God wants us to do until he is finished with us and takes us home. Are you tired on your journey? Do you want to quit? Perhaps it's time for you to retreat from your demands. Rest and rely on God's provisions to be restored. And remember, like Elijah, you have a constant source of encouragement and help. I close with this. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis books that I finished last year is called The Horse and His Boy. It follows a young slave boy named Shasta. He is about to finish his mission and arrive in Arkinland. Arkinland was about to be attacked unaware. And it was up to Shasta and his horse to get there in time to inform them. He's about to arrive and fulfill his mission. But he, like Elijah, is totally spent. Lewis writes, being very tired and having nothing inside him, Shasta felt so sorry for himself that the tears rolled from his cheeks. During his weariness, Shasta realized he is not alone in the darkness. There is a presence with him. Although the boy feared the presence, ultimately it revealed himself as the son of the emperor across the sea, Aslan himself. Aslan revealed how he was with and protected Shasta all the way whether it be in the, amongst the tombs of the dead or in the desert. And it changed Shasta's perspective. Listen to what Lewis writes. The high king above all kings stooped towards him. His mane and some strange and solemn perfume that hung about the mane was all around him. It touched his forehead with his tongue. He lifted his face and their eyes met. 
Then instantly the pale brightness of the mist and fiery brightness of the line rolled themselves together in a swirling glory and gathered themselves up and disappeared. Fellow students, teachers, friends and family, let's understand this. Like the Lord was with Elijah, he is with us. He will give us rest and he will supply our needs according to his purpose on our journeys. The lion of the tribe of Judah has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the ability to come together and worship your name in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I thank you for the school you have drawn me to. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ that you have put by my side. And I thank you for these titans in faith that you have given me to shape me and mold me in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I'm thankful for them all, and I pray for your blessings on us all. And Lord, as graduation approaches, let us not cease to do your works. Lord, let us take heart and let us lift our heads to your angel. And let us eat our bread and drink our water, for the journey is too great for us. But Lord, this is only the beginning. And Lord, let us fa- help us be faithful and true to all that you have us to do while our time still remains. And Lord, we pray for the lost, that you would send us out into your harvest. And Lord, we pray this in the matchless name of King Jesus. Amen.